I want to talk a little bit about innovation. It's a buzzword, everybody's heard about it, but audience participation time starts right now. So I want to ask everyone a question. How many of you have had a great idea but never followed through on it? Raise your hands. So that's more than I expected. Most of the audience, so the people that didn't put their hands up, you're probably telling little white lies as well. Everyone has had these ideas, you know, why don't I have an app that will do this? Why can't I buy this widget that will do the thing I wanted to do? Everyone has these innovations and a lot of people don't follow them through. So why? It's generally because of support, generally encouragement and generally confidence to kind of proceed with the ideas. So if you search online to try and find a definition of innovation, you get the following definition. The action or process of innovating. Hugely informative there, thank you very much. A better but still not great definition is a new method, idea or product. You will notice there nothing about ever actually following through on any of them. Don't apply your idea, don't implement your product, don't sell your idea to anyone around the world. Applied innovation is what's needed, not just innovation in general. So where does it come from? A lot of people are under the understanding that innovation comes from a place like this. Uh, the hollowed halls of uh, universities around the world, you know, the, the kind of ivory towers of big corporate business. They do produce innovation, but they're not the only people. How about this? Somebody with years and years of experience who's done something and they're an, uh, the utmost expert in what they do, but they do it on their own in isolation, away from the support that they need. Both places can be quite innovative. Both places just need to adapt what they do to maximise their own kind of output. And then how do you teach innovation? Can you teach innovation in a classroom? Can you teach it in a university? Do you learn how to be an innovator by reading it from a book or sitting in a class? Or can you learn it by actually applying what you do, using your tools, using your knowledge, using your expertise to directly have an impact on a problem you face as an expert in your field? So why does this matter and how am I related to it? This is me, believe it or not. And ever since I was a kid, I've been around fixing things and solving things. My father was a car mechanic for years, so I used to fix cars when I was a five and six year old. <laughs> that happened. And uh, I used to play with Lego and build construction blocks. I knew nothing but solving problems. And I'm still that way today. The Lego blocks got bigger and the things I built got a lot more dangerous. And then the cars got a lot faster and a lot more expensive. And my shoes got pinker in the process at the same time. <laughs> So I am an engineer, but I know nothing but fixing problems. So when I was younger, a car would come into our garage, we'd find out what was wrong with it, we'd fix the problem. So I've carried that through, through my studies, through the work, through the research I'm doing in the university. So what I tell people, you bring me your car broken, I'll fix it. You bring me your government's energy policy, I'll fix it. You bring me your product that's not selling, I'll fix it. If your heart is broken, ice cream might do it, but I can't do that. So innovation is a kind of buzzword and it's really, really easy to do if you're in a company or in a university, super well funded. My workshop has numerous 3D printers, hundreds of thousands of euros of technology and a whole pool of experts that I can call on. But what happens if you want to innovate in a situation like this? A classroom in Africa that they're lucky if they have power. Innovation potential is locked in all of these students, they just need to get it out. So you need to support them. Their innovative ideas are as good, if not better, than the ones we have here because they have a concept of innovate or die. They have current solutions that they need to be solved to help their lives progress. So in 2014, me and a colleague of mine, Shane Keaveney here, we decided we wanted to contribute our knowledge and expertise in 3D printing to global development projects. So we went looking. We went looking for charities that were implementing 3D printing systems around the world, and we didn't find any. So there wasn't any application of it. There wasn't anyone using it directly on the ground. So we decided this wasn't going to work. So we did something about it. So we set up the Rapid Foundation in 2014. The goal of the Rapid Foundation was solely to distribute the technology and use the people that face the problems on a daily basis, empower, educate, and supply them with the tools and equipment they needed to solve the problems they face to bring out this real innovation potential from people that currently don't have the support or expertise or technology to realize the ideas they have. And th the best thing about it is it actually worked. So two people together applied this solution. We worked with a network of partners around the world and it worked, the outcomes were excellent. So we had outcomes, we put te printers and technologies in AIDS orphanages in India. And in those AIDS orphanages, they manufactured their own educational supplies, geographical uh, visual aids, little models of the Taj Mahal for cultural heritage, cell models to teach kids about biology, things in an education scenario where the school didn't even have books, but in this case they were doing educational principles well beyond what primary schools in Ireland can do. 
We then also did kind of lower cost medical devices and technologies, really simple risks like the wrist brace up on the screen there. It's very, very simple, solved a very basic risk droop problem, but gave a kid that had no other option his life back. Similarly, we did it here. So third world and developing countries are all well and good, but there's lots of people in the first world too that don't, aren't aware of technology or what you can do with it. So we went and we do an awful lot of shows and tours and groups and talks and just encourage people to study science and technology, understand the systems and understand what these cheap consumer systems can do, what you can realise and what you can output with them. And it garners a lot of attention, it garners uh, interest, it garners awards, it garners a mention from the UN, which was great because in our mind that promoted what we do and the applied innovation concept out into the world the more people that have seen it, the more people that wanted to apply it, and we do a huge whole host of opportunities. But I learned a huge amount from it. And one of the best, the, summarising that can be summarised by a quote from Confucius that says, life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. Which is true, and we do the same for solutions. How many times have you heard a solution from somebody and said, that seems massively overcomplicated, it can't be that difficult to do. And we found it generally isn't. You simplify the problem, you simplify the solution, and complexity gets in the way. So complexity, why does it get in the way and why does it exist? In a lot of cases, it could be ego to reference our previous talk again. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough, said Albert Einstein. And he knew his stuff, clearly. <laughs> so if a lot of people hide behind this idea of complexity, hide behind it to kind of sell, either sell a service or sell an idea, or make it complicated because basically they don't understand what they're doing simply enough. They don't understand it well enough. So a lot of people always ask me then, how do you innovate? And I can't answer that, so I can only answer, how do I innovate? So how do I innovate? It's quite an ad hoc, fluid kind of process. I've been doing it since I was a child, so it's a quite kind of difficult concept to pin down, but there's five key points that I use to innovate, and I like to teach people them five key points. I'm gonna teach you now, hopefully. So the first point then is define. You have to know what you want to solve. You have to find a problem. You have to define what wants to be, what, what issue there is in the world. So how do you define it? You could sit in isolation in a room and try and think of problems you can solve, but your success rate is not going to be very good. You're removed from it. What's good is asking people directly. You can ask people what problems they, they face, what issues do they have, and try and solve them. That's a good solution. A better solution is involving people in the process. You make your users a key part of your design team. They feed back, you, feed back information to you regularly. You give them information regularly. They become a part of your design team and the process is a lot more fluid. What's best overall, we found, is you empower the people to create their own solutions. So you give them the education, you give them the encouragement, you give them the support they need to develop the solutions they require in life, which might seem very complicated, but with low cost technologies and the spread of kind of open sharing on the internet, it's been easier and simpler than ever. The second step in that is discover. You need to explore, you need to learn, you need to broaden your horizon and expand your mind. Maybe the problem you're trying to solve the solution exists in a different field. If you're an engineer, look into medicine. If you're an artist, look into craftsmanship. If you're a poet, you probably won't find it in astrophysics, but maybe you will. So look, explore, try new things. And the best bit about trying new things is you want to fail. You don't want to have to be afraid of failure. So failure is quite common, as you'll see now. It'll come up soon enough. But if you fail, try it again. If the solution doesn't work, try another one. If the solution isn't as effective as you want, try another one. There is always more options outside the kind of small area that you're in. So look for them, explore them, broaden your horizons and try and find them. So an example of that I can give you is this group of excellent people here. So these are people from the National Learning Network, which is an education support service in just outside Dublin. And all these people have various educational difficulties and needs. So I went and did an innovation workshop with them. So what I did with them is I did a concept called the good idea, bad idea. So if you've never heard of it before, we put people into groups and they have to think of the worst ideas they can imagine for concepts and businesses and services. And people love doing this. They outdo each, idea or, or each other with stupid ideas. And it, it's, it's really fun until the sting in the tail comes when you swap ideas with the next group and now you have to turn the terrible ideas into good ones. So it's really good, it's to show people that there's no such thing as a bad idea, that there's no such thing as failure, you can pivot, you can switch. And this group in particular had one of the best and then worst ideas I've ever had of, after doing hundreds of these workshops. So their idea was the concrete parachute. You jump out of an airplane, you pull the cord, your parachute pops up and it immediately turns to concrete. Everyone knows immediate death is guaranteed in this case. Terrible idea. 
when they pitched it around deploy, field deployable concrete disaster shelters. So in this case, they threw the parachute out of the plane, it landed on the ground, it deployed as a parachute, immediately turned into concrete, and gave you air deployable emergency shelters for regions in disasters to, to, as disaster response. A terrible idea turned into a great one. And this is such a good idea, I'm now currently investigating this idea with a group of engineers here in UCD. Everyone will get copyright, don't worry, we'll share it together. <laughs> but a great idea with a great outcome. So the third step is design. An idea is great in isolation, but it needs to be something tangible. A huge amount of people in startups, in industry, in companies, in academia have ideas in their head and they never try them in case they might fail. So you have to design it. If it's a website, build it put it out online, get it out there. If it's a product, make it from Play-Doh, Lego, cardboard, paper, 3D printed, it doesn't matter. Make it into a product, get it into people's hands, and then you can evaluate if it is good, what's wrong with it. Your, I guarantee you your hand will tell that the shape of a product is a millimeter too big, better than your eye will. There's a lot of tactile involvement in it. Make it, do it, turn it into something. The fourth stage is demonstrate. You need to show your product works. And a lot of people stumble at this stage is they're afraid it won't work and they're afraid it'll, they'll look bad because their baby of an idea doesn't work. Don't be precious about it. Do throw your baby out with your bad water, get rid of it. If it's bad, it's bad. So you need to demonstrate. So Samuel Beckett once said in one of his books, try again, fail again, and fail better. You shouldn't be afraid of failure. If you fail, you found one way not to do something, then try it another way. Learn from your failures, get it out there. I know a lot of people who work with me try and instigate failure in their products, and then when they get to the stage at the end where it can't fail anymore, it's finished. It's perfect at the end. Don't fail, get it out there and get it demonstrated. And then disseminate, you need to share it with the world. There's no, nothing's gonna come from it if you keep it in isolation. You need to demonstrate, you need to disseminate, you need to get people's eyes on the project. So I can say that, so now I'm gonna talk about some of the projects I'm doing to disseminate them to you, so give me your feedback afterwards and see what we make of them. So I have a project with the Irish government now to do with marine waste and marine litter. It's a huge problem, a next big environmental disaster waiting to happen. It's currently already happened, unfortunately, but we're looking with the government at ways to change how people use one-use plastic use items. So reduce the amount that people use, recycle them more efficiently, turn them into products, turn them into materials, take them out of the sea, and involving citizens themselves, from little kids to retired pensioners, in the whole process so everyone can contribute to the solution in a nice, easy way. We do something similar. We're starting a project now in the Maasai Mara in Kenya with the Maasai people. They have a very ecologically friendly small village and township. They're very protective about what they want to do, but they want to welcome people into it. But of course, they're modern people. They use plastic, they generate waste, they're connected to the internet. So we're working with them to develop new ideas and concepts for them to be more environmentally friendly, protect their environment, but then also create new content, material, and products that they can sell so they can keep living in the place they've always lived in. And if that's not convincing enough on why you should tackle this applied innovation approach, I have one more example of why you should do it. It's the, my favorite thing I've ever worked on full stop forever, and you'll probably agree and you'll see why, which is this project here. So this is Ella, and Ella's six, and Ella was born with no fingers on her right hand. So I met Ella about this time last year, and Ella had, the medical services would not provide Ella with a hand because she said she was too young. She would grow too quickly and her prosthetic hand, which is six, seven thousand euros, would be too small, too fast. They told her, wait till she's 18 and we'll maybe give her a hand then. She would basically have no arm for 18 years and then have to learn how to use it again. So I heard about Ella's situation through somebody I collaborate with Open Aloud. I met Ella, I met her family. They said, can you give her a hand? I said, yeah, sure, I'll see you in a day or two. And we manufactured the hand. So the hand we made there is the Enable Hand, an excellent project, one of the best open source engineering projects you, you, you will ever see anywhere. It was manufactured in the space of six hours. It cost about eight euros in total versus 8,000 euros. And I fitted to her just before Christmas last year, and it gave her her hand back. So applied innovation in principle, and if that doesn't convince you, just look at her father's face, and that's more convincing. You don't need any more convincing after that. So innovation is for everybody. You follow the steps, you tackle the problems, you share them with other people, and if you help and support and give encouragement and the education required to people, everyone, no matter where they're from in the world, can innovate to improve the world we all live in, and then oh, that's a place I want to live in in the future. So thank you for listening to me.